Today, Indonesia is probably most commonly known around the world for one place, Bali. An exotic and romantic vacation spot, so many people view Bali as a representation of Indonesia as a whole. But what about the rest of the nation? How did that one island and the rest that make up the entirety of Indonesia come to? Be what they are now. Where did the history of Indonesia begin? Like its neighbor of Malaysia, Indonesia can trace its first signs of modern human life. All the way back to about 40,000 years ago. Although, there is also archaeological evidence suggesting that 40,000 years may be an underestimate. And other ancestors of today's humans may have been present in the region as long as 1.9 million years ago. Either way, the earliest reliable evidence of a sophisticated civilization in current day. Indonesia dates back to only about 400 BC, with the discoveries of Indian trade goods in the region and inscriptions found in West Java and Eastern Kalimantan. It is also believed that trade with China would have been concurrent with the trade between the Indonesian archipelago and India. Commerce with these particular foreign nations would have also brought the religions of Buddhism and Hinduism to the islands, beginning or contributing to the outside influence on the region. Jumping ahead to the 7th century, the powerful trade-oriented Srivijaya Empire, originating from the island of Sumatra, flourished from the Malay Peninsula down to Java. Despite their remarkable success over multiple centuries, the Buddhist Empire of Srivijaya faced its decline after the Kola Empire from India seized their Sumatran territory of Palembang and apprehended their king in 1025. From that point on, the Srivijaya Empire essentially collapsed, making room for the Hindu kingdom of the Mahapahit Empire. Founded in 1292, the Majapahit Empire rose to dominate the modern-day Indonesian region. Throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, prospering through trade as the Srivijaya Empire had done before them. Still, just as their predecessors, the Majapahit Empire hit a wall and began a rapid downfall. Theirs came after the death of one of their leaders, Gajamada, in 1364, and the following. Death of the king, Hayam Wurik, in 1389. Leading up to this time, the Islamic faith found its way to the archipelago and began to really take hold over the ensuing centuries. Many different lesser-known sultanates found success throughout the islands as a result, some even outlasting the dominion of the Majapahit Empire. As these kingdoms continued to grow trade in and out of the region, European powers became attracted to the spice market that it offered. The first of such nations to arrive in modern-day Indonesia were the Portuguese and the Spanish. In the 16th century, while Spain did attempt to exert some dominance in the Malucca Islands, also known as the Spice Islands, their authority in any part of the Indonesian archipelago was short-lived due to contesting efforts of Portugal and later, the Dutch and British. The Portuguese were initially triumphant in the Malay Peninsula, capturing Malacca in 1511. From there, they aimed their sights towards the Spice Islands, beginning their bid to take control of the spice trade in 1512. While they had some levels of success, they were fairly quickly pushed out through the arrival of the Dutch by the 17th century. In terms of the colonial powers, the Dutch were surely the most prominent intruder into the Indonesian islands. The first Dutch expedition set off for the archipelago in 1595, under the command of Cornelius de Hootman, and dropped anchor at the shore of West Java. Around this time, the Dutch East India Company was formed in order to control trade between the Dutch Republic and the nations throughout the Indian Ocean. The Dutch East India Company was given a significant amount of autonomy by the Dutch government, allowing them to dominate trade throughout the East Indies and keep their competitors, notably the British and Portuguese, at bay. While the original focus of the company was to maintain commercial authority and prosperity, they began to shift their attention as they took control of Java and its neighbors. During the 17th century, the Dutch East India Company made a gradual transition from a leading sea and trading power to more of a colonial-type establishment, after centering themselves in the fortified port of Jakarta Batavia, or modern-day Jakarta. Working to gain more jurisdiction throughout the Indonesian islands, the Dutch East India Company was also able to capture Malacca from the adjacent Malay Peninsula in 1641. When the 18th century came around, though, the company began to struggle with corruption, conflict, and a slow collapse into bankruptcy, 
which resulted in the Dutch government revoking their charter and seizing all of their possessions in 1799. What would eventually become Indonesia was included in the Dutch East Indies, which was established in 1800 and initially acted as the new Dutch colonial authority in the archipelago. This establishment expanded throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, despite occasional ups and downs like the Javanese War, 1825-1830, which the Dutch won. In addition, the Dutch took control of Palembang in 1825, which had previously belonged to the Sriwijaya Empire. Along with resolving disagreements and conflicts with Acre, Lombok, and Sulawesi at this time, the Dutch also continued to enlarge their empire. The inhabitants of the Indonesian islands were treated very harshly under the Dutch colonization. The local farmers were required to set aside 20% of their own land to grow goods for the Dutch to export, such as pepper, sugar, cinnamon tea, coffee, and indigo, as Dutch emphasis switched more towards agriculture. Although the colony transitioned to a free market system and started to create individual plantations by the 1870s, the locals were still not treated fairly in many respects. The Dutch finally implemented a new system known as the ethical policy, at the very beginning of the 20th century to advance the well-being of the archipelago's natives. This new initiative brought about developments like the building of new schools in the area, government reforms that gave local officials more control, and the chance for some of the indigenous people to further their education and learn more about the West. However, not all residents benefited from these changes. Thus many islanders continued to feel oppressed by the colonial government. These resentments eventually led to nationalist groups and a drive for complete independence. Unfortunately, the Japanese invasion during World War II abruptly put an end to the archipelago's residents' struggle for freedom. At first, the locals were not completely displeased by what they saw as a liberation from their Dutch oppressors. Dutch oppressors when the Japanese occupation of the area started, they made quick headway with the Indonesian populace by employing locals for administrative jobs, in contrast to the Dutch, and by being willing to back Indonesian nationalists. The Japanese chose to exploit the Indonesian islands in whatever capacity best suited them during the war, which some locals found objectionable. The successful tactic, however, was only temporary. However, there was not a particularly bad relationship between the Japanese and indigenous, and when the Axis powers started to lose the war, they increased their support for the Indonesian independence struggle. During the latter half of 1944, the Japanese declared their goal of creating a self-governed East Indies, which was later confirmed in August of 1945, when Tarachi Hisaichi, commander of Japan's Southern Expeditionary Army Group, summoned Muhammad Hatta and Sukarno, two Indonesian independence movement leaders, and informed them that Japan intended to make an immediate transfer of independence. The two nationalist men announced Indonesia's independence, declaring it an independent republic. One's word was out of the Japanese surrender to the Allied forces on August 17, 1945. The proclamation of an independent republic was not quite so simple, though, and sparked a series of clashes between the Indonesians and the colonizing forces of both the British and Dutch. The British were less compelled to fight back, eventually withdrawing as the Dutch stepped in to try and retake their former possession. After repeated failures, unsuccessful police actions, and growing condemnation from the far west, such as the U.S., at long last, in the final weeks of 1949, the Dutch recognized Indonesia's independence. The following years marked a time of political and constitutional development, accompanied by agricultural and economic ups and downs as well. Beginning first as a parliamentary democracy, subsequently following what then President Sokarno called a guided democracy, started in February of 1957. The republic then fell into the hands of a dictator, former General Sohardo, in 1966, before finally returning to a democracy as of 1999. Today, Indonesia is still growing and developing as an independent nation and an overall population of roughly 273.5 million people in 2020.